Sorry about that, guys. My my dog tends to be a little bit noisy. Um, so thank you for your patience with that. So we were talking about um, this, this oath. So I've posted the oath along with um, this, uh, this piece on um, presidential reconstruction. So you have huge swaths of men who are joining the Confederate States of America and huge swaths of people who are who are joining the Confederate Army. Now, with this, you you start to see emergences of women who are really pushing um, the Confederate States and their ability to um, to get men into the Army. So, under this, you'll see ladies who start writing letters to their lovers, and they're like, oh, if you don't... Um, enter into the army, you're not truly a man. And so they'll send them this letter with a dress and they'll be like, if you're not man enough to join the army, put on this dress and be a woman. And it will just go on and it'll get worse and worse and worse after this. You, you kind of start to feel sorry for these guys. Um, but you, but under this oath, you can have never served in any form of office. And generally the ruling class did not enter into the any of the, the rank and file of the Confederate Army. So, um, you know, most of them would be disqualified based on that. And this is part of the 10% the plan is that they don't want the ruling class, you know, taking back that, that those positions of power. But under this oath, if you've ever served in the army, if you've ever supported the army, if you've ever sent them food, um, anything along those lines, then you cannot re-enter as a citizen of the United States. Um, and really, that's the, that's the kicker for this, is, you know, at some point, almost everyone has either served or voluntarily supported um, that government or the army at some point. And so it would knock out 95% of the, those who want to vote and who are eligible, normal eligible voters. And so it would only leave the African American population who are the new groups coming in for until that group died or your next group came up, right? Your next group of voters came up and came of age. So this is something that uh, Johnson is just like, no, this can't happen. We can't have this. Lincoln's like, no, we can't do this. We can't have this. Um, and so they want to both ensure African Americans the rights to vote, but they also want Southern Democrats to be able to vote too. And they want the Southern polity in general to be able to vote. Okay, so most radical initiatives are vetoed by President Johnson once um, Lincoln passes. And because of this, they'll try to impeach him. But after 10 years or so, um, the radical Republicans are tired of Southern involvement and they're completely withdrawal troops from the South um, in around 1877. And once they do this, um, there will be more Southern involvement in choosing who gets to do what as far as voting goes. And so you'll see a slow stripping away of African American rights to vote. Um, and this will be a trend throughout history until um, close to the 1960s. Um, now something I want to bring to your attention, um, because it has bearing on kind of what's going on a little bit today. So um, as many of you guys know, there are issues with um, thoughts of impeaching Trump at this point. Now, I will not tell you guys my political opinions. It's not anybody's business. Um, but I will tell you a story of a trial against Andrew Johnson where they attempt to impeach him and to impeach him. And I will bring up some of the issues that are there and show you guys just how hard it is to impeach someone. Now, that being said, um, like I said, none of my political views will come to the forefront here, okay? I just want to make sure you guys are aware of what would happen if there was an impeachment trial for Trump, okay? So this is where historical significance really comes to a head because you can see, um, how these things will affect 
the way America works today. So um, under the Constitution, we have impeachment rules. We have um, historical backing for impeachment rules. And this is one of those cases. So um, the trial will begin in early 1868. Um, and there will be 11 articles of impeachment, which I have listed here for you. Um, the 11th is just a summary of the 10 above, so you really just need to read the first 10 bullets here. And these are all over the internet. I happen to get mine from Wikipedia. Um, but there will be 11 articles for impeachment on his crimes and misdemeanors. Um, so his true charges are that he tried to get rid of a radical Republican who just so happened to be his Secretary of War, and his name was Edwin Stanton. And in 1867, um, Congress will pass a Tenure of Office Act in order to protect the jobs of those who are appointed to lesser positions within the government, and it will make their dismissal subject to the will of Congress. So, for those who aren't really particularly important to the government, um, who can be fairly easily replaced, they're um, making it to where those members cannot be dismissed without congressional approval. So they have to go through this really long process, right? Um, and this trial we p will be presided over by Chief Justice Samuel P. Chase. The impeachment committee will consist of Thaddeus Stevens, Benjamin Butler, John Brigham, uh, John Logan, George Boutwell, Thomas Williams, and James Wilson. On the, con uh, the defense committee, which is on Johnson's side, you'll have Alexander Morton, excuse me, Alexander Morgan, um, Henry Stanbury, William Everts, Benjamin Curtis, Thomas Nelson, um, and Jeremiah Black. The trial itself will begin um, in on March 13th of 1868. It will require that two-thirds of all senators who are present vote. And not only do they have to vote, but they will have to have the majority to, of, the majority will have to approve his dismissal before they can get rid of Johnson to impeach him. Now, Benjamin Wade, who is of Ohio, of Ohio, who suggested the Wade Davis bill, will be kind of the vice president in this case. So um, he would be the one who would be taking over if Johnson is dismissed, and he would be the one who um, is really kind of sitting there watching his fellow party members take on the president who is not of the same party and um and really take them on and, and kind of challenge this idea of this right um but um on the first day the defense will ask for 40 days to gather evidence from so from the time that he's charged and he first comes into court he'll ask for 40 days to gather evidence they'll be given 10 days now that doesn't seem that outrageous in the age of the internet where you can just go online and you can find things. But in an age where you're still running by horse-drawn carriages, maybe, maybe a train if you're wealthy enough to afford a train, this isn't very much time. And it's even more exacerbated if you have to draw in witnesses. So on March 23rd, they'll ask for 30 more days just to get in wit witnesses and kind of put their evidence together. But they'll be denied this. And the next day, they'll come back and they'll ask for six days, which they'll be granted. Now, let's say you've got a witness who's coming from Connecticut and needs to come to D.C. By carriage, you're not going to get there in six days, likely. It's going to take you almost a month, probably, to get there because infrastructure is not very strong at this point, unless you take a train. Now, with a train, you can get there slightly faster, but it's still not fast. The trial will commence and really come to a head on March 30th of 68. And Butler will open with a three-hour speech three-hour speech on the impeachment history. And over the next few days, he'll charge Johnson with violations of the Tenure Act and, sin and um, with sending military orders without approval uh, through to Grant. Okay? And the defense will state that this is all because of Stanton. They know this is because of Stanton. They're ticked. Uh, the, the radical Republicans are ticked off because they tried to get rid of Stanton. And so 
he will claim that Stanton was a holdover from Lincoln's first inauguration, and therefore he's not protected under the Tenure Act. So, um, he will claim that it's his right to um, put somebody else in there who more closely um, works within what he's wanting to do, um, because he's not under the Lincoln administration anymore. The prosecution of the case will rest in April, a very short days later. It's 10 days. The trial itself is 10 days. And that's it. So um, April 9th of 68. Three witnesses will be called in Johnston's, uh, Johnson's defense. Um, and they were able to prove that Johnson appointed William Sherman to better organize the department, not because Johnson didn't like um, Edward's, Edward, excuse me, Edwin Stanton because of his political views. It wasn't an issue of partisanship. It was an issue of better organization of the department. So for all of those that were needed um, in order to convict him, they would need 36 members of the Senate to impeach him, to impeach Johnson. They will only get 35 on the first day that they attempted to impeach him, so the first day that they voted on his guilt, which was May 16th. After this, they will attempt to convict him again on May 26th, and again, they will only get 35 votes out of 36 needed. The last person to vote in each of these elections was uh, Kansas Senator Ross, and both times he chose not to convict Andrew Johnson. And it was only by one vote that Andrew Johnson was saved from being impeached, both times. So where does this leave our legacy with the South? Where does this leave our legacy as a country? Um, the Civil War is probably the most influential time in our country um, prior to 1900. I would assume that it was more influential than us breaking from Great Britain because so many of our laws and so many of our practices so closely um, fit within the schema of, of what we're seeing coming out of Britain and you know some of the trends coming out of Great Britain at the time. I would absolutely say that the biggest change in our country probably came during the Civil War. And a lot of this is out of the laws that come from Reconstruction. So, and a lot of them are also from the economic situations that are coming out of the Civil War. Um, some question whether or not the South is still paying for the Civil War. So you'll see areas where black individuals will um, be kind of segregated off into areas that are that are you know not of quality you know they'll the how to put this delicately there's no way to put this delicately so I'm just going to tell you and, and be as honest with you guys as possible so if the the black people who are freed want land they're going to get the cheapest most awful land that they could possibly get because you will not see white communities allowing them to move into those communities whether they have the money to or not. Um, so for example you might have a white landowner who's got decent land but you've got all of this available and he might be selling his land but you've got all of this land that's over here on the side of a, a muddy bank that's swamp half the time that's available for purchase. The communities will not allow a black person coming out of bondage, whether they have the money or not, to purchase the land that the, the former slave owner held. They will force them to buy the land that's on the swamp because it's cheap, unusable land and they don't want black people to gain power at this point. So they'll be relegated to these kind of awful areas in the South. Um, they have a little more equality in the North. Um, but historically speaking, African Americans coming out of bondage, they're 
their lifestyles are very little better than what they were in bondage. Um, you know, they, they won't be beaten as often, um, or whipped as often. They will be technically free, but in reality, they're still considered cheap labor, cheap sources of labor. And so their, their situation will not be much better. And this will last all the way until the 1960s. And it's not until the 1960s and 70s we'll really see a change in this. So, um, you know, as an example of this, it, from 1865 to 1866, we'll see an emergence of the Black Codes. And um, these will be restrictions on freed Blacks' rights and an attempt to reaffirm them as cheap labor. So, um, for example, when it comes to voting, when black people could actually have a say, black men could have a say on what was going on in government to try to change their, their political standing. They will be barred from the polls, and these will be by legal means initially. Um, but you'll also have these kind of rugged bands of white men who are just like, we're not going to let black men vote. It's not right. We can't do that. You know, um, which isn't to say that it's good. I'm just telling you guys what's historically happened. Okay. So you'll have things like um, if you can't read a sentence in English, you'll be barred from the polls. If you can't, if your grandfather didn't vote, you'll be barred from the polls. Um, if you couldn't pass this test, you'd be barred from the polls. And because you are a former slave and you couldn't read because you were never taught, you'd be barred from the polls. And then if your grandfather was a slave and never had rights, then you couldn't vote because, you know, it, it, there's just not that historic precedent for it. Um, and this will really enrage northern statesmen. And um, they will get frustrated to the point that they will attempt to bar um, southern statesmen from entering Congress once they find this out. Um, and they'll use that as a way to change the laws in order to um, make things more equitable for African Americans in the South. So they'll extend the Freedmen's Bureau in 1866. Um, the Civil Rights Bill, will, uh, they'll pass it and they'll say that anyone who is born in the United States, if they're male, um, will be national citizens with equal rights across the board. Initially, this is vetoed by Johnson, um, and it will completely end his relationship with Congress, which is why we'll see um, the trial of Andrew Johnson, Andrew Johnson for his impeachment. But in 1868, we'll see the first bill become law despite presidential veto. Um, and there's a little link down here. If you guys just hit control and you click on it, um, that will take you to a little video that kind of gives you a little bit more information about this. So in 1867, we'll have more bills that are passed. So you'll have the Reconstruction Act of 1867, where you've got the South divided into military districts. They'll outline what male suffrage should look like, the male right to vote, um, how it should be organized in the South. New outlines for Southern states' governments, which is completely different than what Johnson is was wanting, um, but it's what he gets. Um, the South, and they, they force the South to ratify the 14th Amendment, which will state that um, people will have equal protection under the law despite race. So you can't have um, a white man or a group of white men tried individually for a crime that they committed together and then sentence a group of black men for a crime that maybe or maybe not they, they committed, um, but they'll try them together and judge them together and provide a sentence for them as a whole. And so they will each individually have to, to live out the sentence, if that, if that makes sense. They will expand citizenship um, to all former slaves, and then they will have equal protection of their citizenship from there. Okay? So in 1869, 
there'll be more laws passed. So the 15th Amendment, which is really uh, a crucial piece, and that states that the right to vote shall not be based on color, race, or former, former servitude. So despite the fact that your grandfather was a slave or that you were a slave, you will have the right to vote if you are male. And by 1870, Congress re will readmit all southern states. And from this, the southern states will gain some benefits. It's not all bad things coming out of this radical republicanism. So they'll, you'll start seeing the emergence of state-funded schools, public schools, um, more equitable tax legislation. So if you're poor, you're not paying the same amount of tax as the rich. Um, there will be more laws against discrimination um, based on race. Uh, there will be uh, developments of programs for railroads, for infrastructures, for, for all of those kinds of things that will make basic amenities available to all people. So in your videos, you watched um, how the railroad was really the crucial factor in determining what happens with the Civil War and the outcome of the Civil War. So with this, during the Civil War, part of the reason why the South lost is that their railroads and their ability to transport goods was faulty and supplies was faulty. So you've got railroads that will be this big in some places, and they'll be this big in other places, and they'll be this big in other places, and then you might have some that are slightly turned to one side, or you know something like that. They'll they'll be all different shapes and sizes, and so your railroads can't run continuously along a track. So what the the U.S. government will do is they will regulate the size that the railroad has to be, and they'll match it up with the North that says that all railroads have to be the same size, and they will be continuous from this point forward, so that you don't have railroad engines that can only run on tracks that are this big, or this big, or you know, somewhere in between. Um, it's really just that one size, and so it will, you know, kind of make railroad transportation in the South a little easier, if that makes sense. So let's talk about one last thing as far as race and feuding and those kinds of things go. And that will be the end of our discussion for the day. So with the end of Reconstruction, you'll see the rise in the KKK um, and other issues that will come out of this. But um, most people, when they think about race rela relations, the first thing that comes to their mind is, is the KKK. And this will be um, organized by Nathan Bedford Forrest. And he's a former cavalry general from the South, and he will attempt to disband the KKK when it becomes violent. So initially, he's he doesn't promote violence um, within the Ku Klux Klan. He will attempt to um, mitigate the abilities of the government to allow black people to vote and to have rights. And it's not just black people initially. It's anyone who is white and they they want the ideas of radical reconstruction to be implemented in the South. And that includes black people. Um, but it's not solely black people. So you'll have scallywags who are southern white men who approve of Republican Reconstruction. Northerners who approve of Southern Reconstruction um, will be called carpetbaggers if they come to the South to kind of profit off of Reconstruction. So the South has been, you know, barred from luxury goods for a long time. So they'll start bringing luxury goods South and trying to profit off of selling those lu luxury goods. Um, and then freed black men, um, and women for that matter. Um, and so we'll see an increase of Republicans becoming more conservative over the 70s, uh, the 1870s. And, you know, with this, we will see a targeting of Republican leaders and challenges to their authority. And they will become increasingly more conservative over time. And with Reconstruction, something I should explain about Reconstruction is that you can have overlapping periods in history. So with Reconstruction, you'll, as we go on to the next section, we'll see an overlapping trend that dates to about the same time as Reconstruction. This is called periodization in history. 
And so you will see a period of reconstruction. And then you will see a period of um, antebellum south. You'll see a period of that will come in different names, but they may overlap. So keep that in mind as we go through this, okay? Um, especially when we go on to the next um, the next lecture, because what will happen in the next lecture will really overlap with Reconstruction, and they'll work together to kind of create the, the early 1900s. Um, but anyways, along with Reconstruction, there will also be, in 1874, uh, a period of economic depression. And this will really, really heavily hit the South. Um, the Democratic Party will come back in power for the first time since the Civil War. Um, and they're really a Southern party at this point. But they'll win in the House of Representatives in 1874. There will be a campaign of violence um, by the Democrats, especially in Mississippi. Um, and Grant, who is the president at this point, will refuse to send troops in. And this is what historians see as the end of the Reconstruction era in states' governments, okay? And then um, from there, only two years later, uh, you'll have Republican control only in Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina in the South. So of all of the states, only those three are still in Republican control. Um, in 1876, there will be an, a presidential election compromise where you'll see Rutherford B. Hayes be approved by the, by Congress, which is predominantly Democratic. And because he is a Southerner, despite the fact that he's Republican, um, the Democrats in the South will claim that he is okay and that people should vote for him because he is a Southerner rather than having a Northerner um, who is who wins under the Republicans because the Democrats still are not very strong and they're still divided to the point where they're probably not going to win the election for the president. So instead of having a northern white guy who has no idea what's going on in the South, they'll say, okay, we can deal with Rutherford B. Hayes. We'll make that work uh, because he's southern. Um, but this is where we'll see the end of Reconstruction as a distinct period. And we can start to see the emergence of problems coming into the 1900s. So, um, guys, I know that this was a little confusing. This period is really difficult. And so I'm hoping that um, with those videos that, that we had prior to this, you've really gotten a good feel for the Civil War. And so the things coming out of the Civil War will make sense to you. So um, email me if you have any questions, and that is pretty much it for now. I hope you guys have a good rest of the weekend, and I will see you guys next week. So bye.